Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. I can see some of you signing on. Hello, hello. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Look at you all. Welcome, welcome. While we're getting set up, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Let us know where you're from. People are still jumping on. This is great. Fabulous, fabulous. While everyone is getting settled, I am going to introduce myself and our speaker and do a little bit of housekeeping. So while everyone's getting set up and introducing themselves, my name is Joy McFarland. I'm the product marketing manager here at National Geographic Learning for the US and Canada. Welcome, thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar. Um, a couple of housekeeping things. Yes, everyone will be receiving a certificate and a link to this recording in about five to six business days. Um, so please thank you for your patience on that. You will get an, a follow-up email. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat and we will get to them either in the Q&A after the webinar starts to finish or if it's something about a service or a product, I can hop in and answer that question while we are going on with the webinar. So without further ado, the webinar. Students love these seven tricks. Christian Lee, thank you so much for being with us today. I am going to introduce you now. Christian Lee has worked in English language teaching for over 25 years. His roles have included teacher, teacher trainer, curriculum developer, materials writer, directors of studies, school owner, consultant, and author. He has wide experience in ELT, but specializes in academic English and exam preparation. And he is the author of a dozen textbooks, including ours here at National Geographic Learning that you may be familiar with, 21st Century Communication, Pathways, Listening, Speaking, and Critical Thinking, and World English. So thank you so much for your time today, for joining us for the webinar. I will hand it over to you, Christian. Thank you very much, Joy. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you so much for giving me your time. I know during these uh, busy pandemic days, we've got lots of other things to do, like wonder when the pandemic will end. So uh, it's great to have your time. Thank you. Um, uh, joining you from Toronto, Canada here, as you can tell from my accent, I'm not originally from Canada, but uh, I'll do my best to be clear. And let's begin. Seven tricks that students will love. So we're, we're talking about virtual teaching. That's what we kind of have to do these days because of the, the pandemic. And I think there's a, there's a bit of a problem. There's obviously lots of problems with uh, teaching in the pandemic, but I think there's a couple of problems that teaching virtual classes bring that we maybe don't have when we're teaching a regular traditional uh, in-person class. Um, and I think virtual teaching has what I call a paradigm problem. Um, and it's a paradigm problem because it cannot match two things that students are familiar with. Uh, the first one is the learning paradigm, the traditional classroom, teacher at the front of the room, students sitting there learning, absorbing knowledge, face-to-face -face learning, in other words. I think also the problem with, with virtual teaching is that it doesn't match the, the technology paradigm that students are used to. And a lot of the students we teach these days are effectively digital natives. They've grown up with technology, they're, they're very familiar with how to use it. And we, we find it difficult to match that use of technology in the virtual classroom. Let me talk a little bit more about what I mean by these two uh, paradigms. So the learning paradigm, as we've said, is the sort of traditional classroom situation. You've got uh, a teacher or a trainer at the front of the room and students sitting there looking very attentive. Uh, not sure this is a classroom I would recognize necessarily, but that's the sort of approach that we are used to. Um, a lecture is part of the traditional learning paradigm. Thousands and thousands of students, none of them wearing masks, sitting there in a lecture, and hopefully this will come back at some point. Uh, a classroom with, with young children, again, sort of crammed in there. And, and even a more modern classroom where students are spaced out a little bit more with some technology in the classroom in the form of a smart board. Uh, virtual classes just can't do these things. We can't give students that individual attention face-to-face -face learning. We can't cram lots of people in there, but create an atmosphere with, with the way we're speaking. We have to do everything virtually. And 
students who've grown up with the, the traditional learning paradigm may find virtual classes difficult because it doesn't match their expectations. And then there's the technology paradigm that students are familiar with. Um, as I mentioned, I think students are generally digital natives, the ones we teach. And so they're very, very familiar with technology. They've got their smartphones and their tablets with all of these fun apps that they use all the time, including in our classes sometimes. And we, we find it difficult to produce that. We can't necessarily use virtual learning for enjoyable things like going to a club or listening to music um, or playing games, for example. And a particularly important part of the technology paradigm for many students is that technology is something they do together apart. They're sitting there using their phones all together, having fun together, but yet doing something individually. And because of the, the classroom situation, we, we find it difficult to do that, to have that together apartness. So we've got this problem. So I think virtual classes can, can fail on two levels. It's nobody's fault. It's just the nature of the situation. Um, and because of that failure, and you can see I'm using quotation marks to suggest that it's not really a failure. It's just, it is what it is. Um, this, this failure can cause a chain of negative outcomes. Um, some students may feel less motivated to study. Um, as a result, they may learn less. And as a result, they may feel less engaged and less satisfied. If we were to take that chain a little bit further uh, and a little bit tongue in cheek, um, if students are less engaged and less satisfied, my boss is going to be less satisfied. My job will be less secure. My mortgage will be in trouble. Um, a, a chain of negative outcomes that we really want to avoid. But it's not all students. I think it's some students are going to struggle with this. Um, and that brings us on to a quick question for you. Um, in the chat box, if you could, what do you know about a marketing persona? Type your ideas in the chat window, please. <clears throat> the first three answers in the chat window were the ones I was looking for. No idea, nothing, no idea. So that's that's fantastic. It means at least you've learned something from this uh, from this session. Whew. I see one at least one person who's got the answer more or less right. Good. So a marketing persona. It's pretty obvious, really. A marketing persona is a composite sketch of a key segment of a target group that has certain values in alignment. I'm sure that's what most of you were, were thinking. Right? Uh, maybe not. Um, how about some, you know, actual English, not jargon? A persona is a fictional character who is representative of a group. Um, in, in marketing, people talk about personas as this group of target audience and this group of target audience. Um, and rather than talking about the group, they give a name to this group and they, they choose a person for this group, a, a character, if you like. And this character represents that group. So let me share with you three, um, three personas that we can think of in terms of our students. This is Anna from uh, Brazil, let's call it. And her intrinsic motivation can be high. Intrinsic motivation, as I'm sure you will remember, is the motivation that comes from within. Um, but she can lose focus easily, especially these days. Uh, one of her grandparents is sick. Her parents are not doing very well because her mum lost a job. Um, so she's losing her focus fairly easily. But she does want to learn, and her intrinsic motivation can, can be high. So if we have virtual classes that are particularly engaging, she's going to be fine. But if, if our classes are not as engaging as they could be, some of those other worries that are concerning her, they might take over and she might lose some motivation. This is Javier. Javier is from Spain. Uh, and Javier has uh, high extrinsic motivation. Um, his boss really wants him to learn English. But his boss is also talking about cutting his salary and maybe cutting his job entirely. So that extrinsic motivation isn't a big factor. And his intrinsic motivation is limited. He doesn't really want to learn English because he might just be about to lose his job. He'd rather focus on the important things in his life, like his family and his cool taste in hats. 
And then as a result, virtual classes are not an ideal learning medium for him. He would be much better perhaps in an in-person class. And then we've got May uh, from Japan. And May has a uh, very high intrinsic motivation. She needs English for her future. So as a result, her motivation is gonna stay high, even in a virtual class. Now in a traditional classroom situation, our aim would be to help all of these students, all of these personas equally. And we do that by providing individual attention, personalized support. But of course, as we all know, this is much, much harder to do in a virtual classroom. So of these three personas, Anna, who represents a student who's got high intrinsic motivation, but it's variable. Javier, who's got high extrinsic motivation, but relatively low intrinsic motivation. And May, who's got very high intrinsic motivation. Of these three personas, who should we target in our virtual classes? Uh, again, if you've got some thoughts in the chat. Uh, I can see a lot of people suggesting that it should be all of them. And obviously, yes, that would be ideal. Uh, Javier is getting quite a lot of love. I think all of you just like his hat. Um, Anna, a little bit of a late search for Anna. Let's move on. This is quite difficult to suggest, but I'm going to say that maybe Javier should be not targeted, that maybe we should be focusing on Anna and May. And I'll, I'll explain why. Um, Anna and May both have a positive attitude. They, they have high intrinsic motivation. So if we can keep them very much engaged, then I think that positive influence might have a positive effect on others, including Javier. And although it would be fantastic to get Javier on board, to engage him as much as we could, um, that's a huge time investment because he doesn't have high intrinsic motivation. And there's no certainty that we're going to get him engaged, that we're going to get that reward. And in the meantime, we might be losing Anna because she doesn't want some of the things that Javier needs. We're not going to lose May because of her high intrinsic motivation, but maybe she isn't as satisfied as she would otherwise be. Now, the point here is not to say that we should ignore certain students. Of course, we would never do that. But the point is that when we're focusing on our classes, we're never going to make everybody happy, regardless of the classroom situation, whether it's an in-person class or a virtual class. But I think virtual teaching requires us to make some, some fairly tough choices about the best things for the majority of students in the class. And I think really important, if we can get Anna and May both really engaged and motivated, Javier is going to find it less of a barrier to become motivated himself, I think, because he will see how positively the other students, the other personas, are engaging in the class. So we've got our problems. Um, Virtual classes don't match students' expectations of learning. They don't match students' expectations of what technology can do. Uh, virtual classes are not nearly as much fun as a smartphone. And we've got different personas, different groups of students who are going to have different levels of engagement, different levels of motivation. And that makes things difficult. Now, that's always true in a, in a classroom situation. But a virtual class, those things become magnified, uh, in my experience. So here's what we can do. Uh, I think we can learn from clickbait headlines. Clickbait, those irritating images and links that you see all over the internet, especially when you click on a site and then another site and then another site and you end up somewhere that you didn't necessarily expect to be. And clickbait is very, very tempting to click on. And here are some examples. Top doctor reveals the three worst things you eat every day. The secret for saving money your bank won't tell you. And 12 unbelievable pet rescue stories. You'll cry about number nine. Now, these are not ads exactly. They sort of are, but they sort of aren't. These are links that take you to some content, some story. And the story is supposed to tell you what these three worst things you eat every day are, or what the secret is that your bank won't tell you, or why these pet rescue stories might make you cry. But of course, these clickbaits often don't 
tell us the answer because it's among the worst things on the internet. So what, what can we learn from it? Well, I think the important thing about clickbait is that it's, it's how clickbait gets people to click. We know probably that we're not going to get value from this, but yet it's really engaging. Why? Well, one trick is that it breaks topics into bite-sized chunks, small pieces, small enough to consume quickly and easily. We feel like it won't take a lot of time to, to get the information we want. That's kind of important. Even more important is that clickbait creates what they call a curiosity gap or a knowledge gap. What are those three worst things that we eat? Uh, do I eat them? Should I stop eating them? Why are they so bad for me? Um, what is this money saving secret? I want to know this money saving secret. I want more money. Well, the pet made me cry. Why does it make me cry? I'm, I'm really curious now. So this curiosity gap really brings people in, gets people to be interested. And then the last thing that clickbait does is that it waits as late as possible to fill the gap. And, and it, in fact, may never fill it. Um, I'm sure we've all followed these links and we've wanted to find out what those three worst foods are. And then we get to the end and we're like, I still don't know what those three worst foods are. And I've just wasted 10 minutes of my life. So clickbait is evil in, in some ways, but it's valuable for us because it can really help us to make our lesson topics more engaging, more interesting, if we were to steal some of these secrets from them. So we can break our lessons down into bite-sized chunks, into small pieces that give us this kind of information. Um, and we can create curiosity gaps or knowledge gaps that students are interested in learning or filling those gaps. Now, obviously, in a classroom situation, we want to make sure we do fill the gaps rather than leaving students left hanging. So uh, very simple, how can we use this in our classes? Here's your lesson, relative clauses. Sounds pretty exciting, as I'm sure you agree. On the other hand, today's lesson, several, uh, seven essential details about relative clauses. You'll love number six. Now, okay, it's, it's deliberately a little bit humorous, but I think you get the idea that we don't have to say, look, it's relative clauses. We can try and make it more inciting, more interesting. We can break it down instead of relative clauses. We've now got seven small things about relative clauses. We can make it interesting that number six is particularly useful. Instead of saying you'll love number six, maybe you say, you know, numbers five and six are great for writing or numbers three and four are perfect for speaking. If you're teaching a test class, you might want to say that, you know, numbers one, two, and three are great for writing exams in TOEFL or IELTS, for example. So the point is that we can we can try to use some of these clickbait ideas to make our um, to make our lessons sound more interesting. We're not actually doing anything different. We're just thinking about the presentation a little bit more. The second solution, the second suggestion that I offer to make our classes more interesting, more engaging, is to set challenges. Um, and when I when I really got into teaching, I became a teacher who, who set a lot of challenges for my students. And some of my peers, some of the other teachers that I was working with, would, would question my approach. They would say things like, you know, we shouldn't be setting challenges. We should be nurturing students and making them feel comfortable and safe. And yeah, you know, I understand that. It's, it's fantastic when students feel nurtured and safe and comfortable. But students are there to learn. And challenges are a really fantastic way to learn. And if students can overcome a challenge, they feel really good about themselves. Um, so I think challenges are actually a very powerful tool for us. But we need to make sure that the challenges are principled. We're not just setting a challenge to be mean or to set a challenge for the challenge sake. We're setting principled challenges that have a goal, a purpose, and that purpose has a, a, pedago a strong pedagogical foundation. In other words, we know why we're doing them and we're doing them for a reason that will benefit our students. We need to make sure that we set challenges that are at the right level for students. Challenges that are too difficult are gonna be demotivating. Students won't feel that they're getting anything. Challenges that are too easy are also demotivating. Students just think, well, I haven't learned anything new. Um, a little trick I use is to keep the ideas of roughly tuned and finely tuned input in mind. Uh, if you remember from your early teacher training days, roughly tuned input is probably just above students level. It helps to pull them up. And that's a great level for setting challenges at. 
finely tuned input is really close to the student's level and for challenges that's possibly a little bit too easy for students so we go a little bit above where they can do it and then of course provides as much support as you need and as much support as you can uh, through the virtual medium that you're using and, um, and this is one that I need to keep reminding myself of personally. Uh, don't set too many challenges. Don't use them too often because they can become stale and boring. Uh, we've already talked about this, the ideas of roughly tuned and finely tuned input. Um, and there are three broad kinds of challenges. I'm not trying to give you all, all the sort of rocket science here. Um, so what I call regular challenges, micro challenges, and ongoing challenges. Um, regular challenges is the stuff you do in the classroom normally. Um, they, they don't take too long to complete, a few minutes at most, uh, standard textbook activity, um, uh, a quiz, a formal quiz or an informal quiz, um, or any kind of productive task, writing or speaking. And these are just the regular challenges. It's a normal part of an everyday classroom. Micro challenges are something that perhaps are less familiar to you. And these are things that typically take less than a minute to complete. And, and often they're in the form of a question. So you'll ask a question that has a specific challenge intent behind it. Um, you might want to just very simply ask a student for a synonym of a word or an antonym of a word if you're trying to build some vocabulary. Um, you might ask a student to explain his or her answer. Okay, great, the answer for question three is A, good. Please tell me why. And you might stop in the middle of a sentence and ask students for the next word. Um, this is a nice one because it gets students to be thinking about the context of language. Um, English has a massive vocabulary, but often in the middle of a sentence, there are only a limited number of words that may come up or would naturally come up in that point. And so this is a very simple challenge that can get students to think about the context of language and how the context can constrain what language might be used next in a natural way. Now, micro challenges are one feature of something called demand high teaching. Um, demand high teaching, I'll type that in the chat. If any of you are familiar with this, you'll know what I mean. If you're not familiar with it, this is something that I think is really quite powerful as a way to, um, to think about teaching more than anything else. So this is something that you might want to look at, to search for, to see if you can um, find more information about that. Now, the third type of challenge we talked about was something that we call an ongoing challenge. Ongoing challenges are ones that happen throughout a class. You set up a challenge at the beginning of the class and then it's ongoing throughout that class. Um, sometimes it may even be an ongoing challenge throughout a course. If you've got several weeks worth, you may want to set up that challenge early in the course and then have it ongoing throughout. Um, and they, they may include things like asking students or challenging students to correct errors that they see or hear you make. Um, this is one that I've used quite successfully for, for years and years and years. In the first class with students, I would say, look, I'm going to challenge you by making mistakes every class. They're going to be deliberate mistakes. And these deliberate mistakes are ones that I think are important for you. And when you hear me make a mistake, when you see me make a mistake in my writing on the board, your job is to try and um, call it. So say, look, this is a mistake. Now, there's, there's several reasons why I do this. One because I sometimes make mistakes without noticing that I've made a mistake. And if the students say, you just made a mistake, that's kind of embarrassing. But if I've set up this ongoing challenge and I've said it's, it's deliberate, the students are gonna think I'm just being a great teacher, even though I made a terrible mistake, really careless. They don't know it was careless. They think I'm being on purpose being a great teacher. So I kind of save myself some embarrassment. The second reason is that I really want students to develop this ability to recognize errors because if they can recognize errors that somebody else is making, they're gonna fix it for themselves. It's part of what's called self-monitoring. Self-monitoring is when you monitor yourself for mistakes, but if they're monitoring other people as well, it's going to develop much more quickly that they, they become really good at correcting their own errors. And the third reason is that students will inevitably, they'll, they'll notice a mistake that is in fact correct English. So it brings up this amazing amount of emergent language in the classroom 
where students will say, I think this is a mistake. And then we get a great opportunity to discuss something. It clears up lots of misunderstandings or things that students weren't quite sure about. So it's a really quite uh, an effective technique to use. Uh, the main reason is the lack of embarrassment for myself. Um, and yes, that was because I was terrible at grammar early in my teaching career. If, um, if we've just taught students a particular grammar structure or we've taught them some vocabulary, for example, I might challenge them for the rest of the class to avoid making mistakes with that particular grammar structure. So it's a way to get students thinking about it, reminding themselves. It affects fluency a little bit, of course, but we've got that feeling, that balance going on between fluency and accuracy. And this is a nice way to get students, again, just thinking a little bit about how to um, how to correct their own mistakes, how to use English naturally. Uh, the opposite, I'm sorry, this would be um, the opposite of this is to use that word or to use that grammar structure to try to get that practice going on. So uh, th there's obviously lots of other examples of ongoing challenges that you could that you could offer to your students. But I think this is one that is really quite a nice one because it, it feels like there's this thread running throughout the class or running throughout the course and students can get really uh, interested and really motivated with this. And this challenge, this ongoing challenge works quite nicely with, with the next point that we're going to talk about, which is to gamify your class or gamify parts of your class. Now gamification is a word that I'm sure you've heard or you've seen recently because it's becoming one of those um, buzzwords, those exciting words. Um, and you think about gamify is obviously it's connected to playing games, but it's it's much more than just playing games. Um, one definition that I find quite useful is that gamification is the principled use of game elements and game mechanics in non-game situations. Um, and this word principled has come up before. R just a reminder, you're doing something with a purpose, you know why you're doing it, and you believe it's going to benefit your students. That's all it means to be principled. So what are these game elements? Um, you've got lives, you've got goals, you've got levels, you've got points, you've got teams, those kinds of things, the things that most games have. And game mechanics are the things that make the game work, the, the rules of the game. The game might have challenges. Games will often have randomness. Um, some things are random to make it a little bit more chancy. Uh, games often have turn-taking, the success or failure, or all these kinds of things. Um, and I'm curious if you can think of any real world examples of gamification that you've experienced or you've noticed in, in life. Again, the chat window is your friend here. Some, uh, some excellent ideas and often uh, some of you are talking about online learning stuff, which is fantastic because that's why we want to talk about gamification. But um, one real world example that I think is quite interesting is the, the Apple Watch, which has these close your rings feature. Um, if you know how it works, you've got these three rings. I, I don't have an Apple Watch, so I don't know exactly how it works. But the, the basic idea is that by doing these activities, you close those rings and you feel good about yourself and you know that you're doing good for your body as well. So this is an example in the real world where they've tried to make something that we should do, moving around, walking and so on. They've made it into more of a game to get people motivated. Um, so it's kind of a nice example. Now, in the classroom, which is really what we want to be talking about, gamification has become really important because... Um, it has so many good benefits. One of them is that it boosts engagement. It boosts fun. Um, it, it raises motivation. It makes students more interested. Um, it, it can foster learning and desired behavior. Um, it can create world peace. Oh, no, sorry, not world peace. Um, forget about that. Uh, but it, it does have all these, these powerful benefits. And I'm sure you know there's lots and lots and lots of research that says, very simply, when students are enjoying themselves, they learn more. When students are having fun, they learn more. When students are interested and motivated and engaged, they learn more. So 
because we want to make our classes interesting and engaging, but because virtual learning makes that more difficult, gamification becomes even more important. And luckily, because there's all these online tools and stuff, gamification becomes a little bit easier. Um, and of course, gamification does work particularly well in terms of setting challenges. And one of the things that I've been doing for years is gamifying these ongoing challenges. So we talked about this idea of, of telling students there are going to be mistakes and asking them to correct those mistakes. Sometimes with some groups, I would actually divide the whole class into two teams and the teams get points every time they correctly identify an, an error that I've made or, or sometimes that they've made themselves. And over time, you know, over the course of a class or a whole course, the scores are going up on the blackboard or the whiteboard and students have this, this built-in motivation. And with technology, if we're doing virtual classes, we've got another window open where you're keeping track of the scores. There's lots of apps that you can search for, uh, online tools that you can use for this kind of thing as well. So there's lots and lots of things that we can do gamifying our classes. Now, my, my goal here today is not to, to tell you how to do all these things. It's to sort of suggest some ideas that might make the classes more motivating and interesting. And hopefully some of those will interest you enough to go away and find out. But if you want to uh, uh, send me an email through uh, National Geographic, I'll be happy to share some links that I have. Uh, so as I've said, you gamify a team challenge, for example. Now, when we set up gamified activities, it can take a little bit of time. Um, so this is something you will want to probably prepare ahead of time and set it up. Um, but in, in my experience, the benefits are generally worth it, especially with, with virtual classes. It really can make a difference in how much fun the class is. Um, and as I said, there's lots of resources on the internet. So just uh, Google or search for um, gamifying virtual classes, gamifying language teaching classes, you, you'll find lots and lots of resources from, from people who specialize in gamification much more than I have. The, the fourth suggestion I have for raising motivation and so on is to give students agency. Um, and agency is one of those terms that it's, it's used a lot. And there's lots of different definitions for it. So here's the one that I found to be particularly useful for me. Um, Game, uh, agency involves giving students three things, uh, voice, the opportunity to share their opinions, to express their ideas, choice, a chance to choose whether they do this or that, and then ownership. Um, and ownership is perhaps the one that's a little bit more difficult to understand, but it's the idea that students um, are doing something meaningful for them. They actually want to be the owner of this. They want to do it well because it's actually important for them. So voice, choice, and ownership. And I think there's a lot of benefits for giving students agency. And these can include things like boosting motivation and engagement levels. And as I've already said, when motivation and engagement goes up, students are going to learn more. It can also make students more reflective, reflective learners. And when students are reflective, they're thinking about their own learning. And when students are reflecting on their own learning, they're likely to become more active, active participants in that learning rather than passive uh, recipients of learning. And it can also foster what we call a growth mindset. And I'm curious, what is a growth mindset? And what is the opposite? Once again, in the chat, please. So this one was a much easier question for you than the, uh, the early one about marketing personas. So that's great. Many of you've got the answer. Yeah, um, a growth mindset is a, a can-do attitude, the feeling that you can get better. A uh, fixed mindset is the opposite, and that's the opposite thinking, that you cannot get better. This is something you just don't do or don't like. Um, and I can share an example with you of uh, a fixed mindset and a growth mindset that comes from my own personal life. Um, when I was a child growing up, um, I was a really picky eater. I was a really fussy eater. There were loads and loads and loads of foods that I just didn't like. 
somebody would say, do you want this? And I would say, no, I don't like it. I don't like this food. I don't like this food. I don't like this food. Um, and that was a problem for me because I, I was really limited in what I could eat. I was limited in what I could enjoy, but I wanted to experience the world. And when you don't like a lot of foods, that becomes quite difficult. Um, and so when I had children, I was really, really wanted to avoid having that problem for my children. And um, I came up with a strategy. And what I did when I was feeding new foods to my, to my son, my oldest son, I would say, do you like it or not? And he would say yes or no. And every time he said no, I would say, oh, you don't like it yet. And that word yet was enough for him to become this amazing eater who loves almost everything. Um, an example, when he was four years old and it was his birthday, I said to him, what, what do you want me to cook for your uh, birthday dinner? Because I, I do most of the cooking in our family. And he said he wanted a Spanish paella. And I was like, cool, okay, we'll do a paella. Um, and so four years old, he, he's, that's his choice for birthday food rather than pizza or hamburgers or something. And so that word yet was the powerful word. And if we can teach our students that feeling as well, that they can do it, they're going to be able to develop their intelligence, develop their abilities through diligence and through hard work. And students believe that failures and mistakes are a sign that they are not good enough yet. Not that they will never be good enough, not that this is too hard, it's hard and they can't do it yet. And if we can encourage that feeling, and we can do that, I think, through giving students agency, then I think we're going to have um, students who've got this feeling, I can do it or I will do it. And that's quite powerful. Fixed mindset, uh, intelligence and ability levels are fixed. Failures, mistakes are a sign that they are not good enough and never will be good enough. So giving students agency has lots of benefits, but there's also a problem. Um, and the problem is that when we give students agency, we're essentially saying, hey, go and do stuff alone. But that's difficult enough in a traditional class and even more difficult maybe in a virtual class because often agency is gonna be getting students to work together. And so that is quite challenging, I think, in a virtual class. Um, and you can certainly give students a task and you can say, look, I want you to do this. I'm giving you some agency. You don't have to use that word, but you know that that's what you're doing. You've got that purpose in your mind. And you say, please go and do it. And you trust your students to do it. And that's absolutely fine. Um, and it, it works, but it works really if you're giving your students the opportunity to work alone. Um, another opportunity, another option, excuse me, is to have your students work together in groups virtually. Um, lots of advantages here. Uh, and obviously it's gonna require some setup, um, but there are many free online tools that can facilitate this approach. Um, one that I use is this free uh, site called Whereby. I've typed that in the chat window for you. Uh, and essentially this is like uh, Zoom for small meetings of up to four people. Um, and it's, I think, quite useful. You could have your students on the Zoom with you or whichever platform you use. Uh, I've put it on the screen as well, but I thought the chat would be helpful for you. Uh, and here's how it looks. Just a standard uh, web conferencing, video conferencing app, uh, completely free to use, up to four people. So you could set up three or four rooms yourself ahead of time. You assign groups of three students to work in each room, and then you can pop into the rooms as you like to monitor, to assist. So I think we can use the advantage of technology ourselves to make some of these things that seem difficult more straightforward, more useful for students. Uh, another question for you. Uh, I was going to do a traditional poll, but I decided that any of you in America would be tired of polls right now. So let's just use the chat, okay? So what tool do teachers use more than any other during a class? Seem to be two, two groups here. Uh, some of you saying whiteboards or slides, that kind of thing. So sharing the information. And some of you are talking about yourself, your brain or your voice. 
And I'm going to go with, with that one. Um, the voice. In, in general, teachers use their voice more than any other tool during a class. Um, not, not always. Um, certainly, you know, yes, your, your brain is probably there all the time. Uh, your body's there all the time. But I think as, as an actual tool for teaching, then the voice is probably up there. Um, and, and that's why we're talking about TTT, which I'm sure some of you will know is, is a, an abbreviation for teacher talking time. Um, and because teachers use their voice a lot, I think there's a general warning in teacher training courses that says something like student talking time, good, teacher talking time, bad. And I get it. Yes, this is good advice. But I think in some situations, teacher talking time can actually be a good thing. Um, I made a career, not necessarily a very successful career, but I made a career out of doing a lot of teacher talking time um, because I was teaching a lot of exam classes. And I, I made the decision that I knew the exam better than my students and I needed to share that knowledge with my students and I needed to be kind of guiding them. And the best way to guide them was to take the information in, to give it back out, take information and give it back out. So there was quite a lot of teacher talking time. Um, and yet that was quite effective. So I think it can be a valuable tool. Um, and I think in virtual classroom situations, um, it, trying to get students to talk in virtual classroom situations can be quite difficult logistically. There can be microphone issues, there can be technology issues. Uh, maybe this student's cat just jumped onto the keyboard. There's all sorts of things going on but at least you can talk because your technology situation should be more stable. So I think in a virtual class, teacher talking time could be a valuable tool for us. So it's a, it's a vice, it's a bad situation, but let's make a virtue out of it. Let's come up with something valuable. So let's use teacher talking time, but we're going to try and meet certain criteria. It's gonna be principled, my favorite adjective today, and it's gonna be purposeful. We know what we're doing, we know why we're doing it, and we have a clear goal in mind. Um, the value to students should be explicit and it should be as interactive as possible. And then what specific way of using their voice? Um, I want to make sure we, we don't run out of time. So I'm going to jump ahead on this one. The specific way of using their voice is that we can ask questions. If we're going to talk, questions are a fantastic way, a powerful way to do that. Um, and I think one of the reasons that they're so good for teachers, particularly in virtual classroom situations, is because they are interactive. We're asking and students are going to answer, whether it's a chat question or a, an, a voice question, there's, there's some interactivity going on. So it makes that teacher talking time less because the students are having to engage. And yet, despite this importance of, of questions, um, I've certainly not ever been, been trained in how to ask questions, whether it's a pre-service training course or an in-service training course. Um, I've never seen this done, or very rarely, and I, I think that's a shame because questions are so valuable. So here's a few ideas for how we can ask questions effectively, and these are things that I've done because I've actually thought quite a lot about how to ask questions carefully. So here are some of the highlights of, of what I've come up with. Um, when you're going to ask a question, make sure there's a clear purpose. You know why you're asking this question. You know what you want from it, in other words. Um, you are asking a question that students are going to be able to answer and are going to be willing to answer. There's nothing worse than asking a question the students just don't know, or you ask a question the students feel uncomfortable. We certainly don't want that. Um, and then, and this is kind of important, is that you, you kind of need to know the answer. Um, if you don't know the answer or the answers, uh, you can get that embarrassment situation. And as you've already learned, I really don't want to be embarrassed in the classroom. Um, and I've, I've made it clear that in fact, sometimes there are more than one answer to a question. And I think really important is when you've asked a question, it's great to be open to possible answers that you hadn't thought about. Uh, sometimes we have this sort of knee jerk situation of that's not the answer I expected, so no, but maybe it is a good answer or valid answer. And often wrong answers or unexpected answers will, will shine a light on students thinking, show you something that they didn't know or would like to know. So how do we ask questions effectively? Not just what kind of question should we ask, but how? Well, the reason for asking a question is to get something from students. The question itself is just a vehicle to get information or knowledge or ideas from the student. So the question itself should not be complex. It should be as simple as possible to get that job done, to get the information from the student. 
we really need to allow time for students to answer. Um, asking a question poses a cognitive challenge to students. We've increased their cognitive load when we ask them a question. Because the question will be in English, which is not their native language, the cognitive load is greater. So students are going to need time to understand the question, to process the question, to think about their answer, to formulate their answer, and to actually answer. So um, one of the things I've said in when I do teacher training courses is I say, be silent for as long as you can until it gets a little bit uncomfortable for you. And that won't actually be uncomfortable for students often. Sometimes it will, but generally speaking, if you wait and wait and then a little bit more, you're going to find that you get more from your students. And I think silence is sometimes a really good thing. I also tried to control how students will answer and who will answer. Um, how means whether I'm going to ask them to answer individually, in groups, uh, chat or voice. Um, and I, as much as I can, I like to know who's going to answer. If I've got a question that's purposeful in my mind, I have a, often I have a student in mind that I want to answer. Uh, Javier made a mistake last week or with this grammar point, so I'm going to ask him again this week to see whether he's learned it. So don't ask questions unthinkingly, ask them strategically in a way that gets students interested, motivated and engaged. We're almost finished. I'm sorry, we're going to be a couple of minutes over. Can you complete this well-known saying for me? Something is the something of life. Some interesting choices, but the majority of you are coming up with the variety is the spice of life, which is the standard expression. Variety is the spice of life. Uh, and I think this gives us the final suggestion for today's session. Keep things varied. Um, and this kind of comes back to the idea of clickbait headlines that we started with, those seven tricks that students love. Um, when we're teaching virtual classes, we want to be as varied as possible. Um, and because students focus, their motivation, their energy is going to flag, is going to drop after a while. So if we mix things up, if we keep things changing, I think we're going to have more engaging, more motivating, more interesting classes. As I said, clickbait does this. It breaks things down into bite-sized chunks, and we can do this as well. We don't want to spend more than 10 or 15 minutes on any one activity in a traditional classroom that's not a problem you can feel the energy in the room you can change things you can motivate things you can get students going in a virtual class that's much more difficult so my advice my um, suggestion based on my experience is that if you have chunks of time 10 or 15 minutes and you do something different often more often than in a, uh, a regular classroom it can keep things moving keep things feeling fresh and energetic um, and very simply I mean when you when you plan your lessons for virtual lessons, um, you could simply plan a traditional class and then mix things up. But I found that um, when I'm planning virtual classes, I want to actually think from the beginning that I'm going to create these bite-sized chunks, these short segments, because I find that that actually works better. It allows me to keep the variety greater and therefore keeps the class as interesting as possible. And that is everything. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I was uh, really appreciative of all the comments that you put in. So thank you very much. Thanks, Christian. Do you have time for a couple of questions? Of course. All right. So we have a couple of questions in the Q&A box. The first one is, do you think that doing a needs analysis in class might also help students to be more engaged in the classroom and motivated? Uh, on a, on a, as a general rule, needs analysis is fantastic. Of course, we, we, we really should be doing that. Um, and it's it's quite a lot of work for the teacher. It's also quite a lot of work for the students. And my, my concern sometimes with a virtual class especially is that if we do it in the class, it's not very engaging and motivating itself. The, the, the data you get from it can be very, very useful. But if we're doing it in the class itself, it's not a great way to use that time because some students are not going to enjoy. If we do it outside the class, we set it as an, a homework assignment or something. In my experience, the 
the students who are going to do it are the ones who are already motivated and engaged and interested. So we might get a slightly um, skewed set of data that's focusing on the things that the, the, the engaged students want rather than those less engaged students. Um, I like to do a needs analysis sort of an ongoing basis. Every time I hear a question from students, every time I see a mistake from students, I kind of take that as needs analysis that goes into my data and I'm thinking I, I need to do something more. Um, every time students bring up a topic, uh, if, if three or four students bring up the same topic, again, my, my sort of alarm goes off and think that would be a great topic to bring up. They're obviously interested in that. So a combination of those two things, uh, a specific formal needs analysis is great if you can do it in a way that doesn't affect the class negatively. And then this informal ongoing needs analysis where you're constantly adjusting what you're giving students based on what's coming back from them. Thank you. The next one is how do you optimize the teacher talk time without reducing the student talk time? And what is the ideal amount of student talk time in online class in your opinion? It, this is such a difficult question in virtual classes, online classes, because it really depends on the platform you're using, uh, the, the class size you have, and all those variables. So it's, it's almost impossible to answer. Um, I, like I said, I, I love teacher talking time. Um, I'm happy to have a lot of teacher talking time. But when students take my classes, I, they, they don't necessarily, they don't, I don't want to say ever, but they, they very rarely complain that I'm talking too much because it doesn't feel like I am because there's lots and lots of challenges going on. There's always something for students to do. Lots of these micro challenges coming up, these, these essentially questions that get students to think and answer. Um, and going back to this idea of demand high teaching that I mentioned briefly, one of the one of the other features of demand high teaching is something that's called one to one within a group. And my my way of doing this is that I might have, um, sorry, let me see if I can explain this clearly. I want to get here. And to get here, I do a series of very, very small steps. And each small step goes to a different person. Everything comes back through me and then to a different student, back to me through a different student, back through, back through. So that I might engage eight students to get to the end of something. And I didn't need to do that necessarily. I could have done it in two stages or three stages. But by breaking it down into eight small steps, I'm, I'm engaging students more and giving everybody the feeling that they're actually part of something and getting involved in it. Um, going back to the idea of what's the best um, ratio of teacher talking time to student talking time, it really does just depend on your technology situation, your classroom situation, what your school or institution want, what your students want, what the parents of the students want, depending on which country you're working in. Um, just find a balance that works for you. And if students are really enjoying your classes and are motivated and interested, nobody's going to mind if there's 60% teacher talking time to 40% or the other way around. Hopefully that's uh, useful. Thank you. And another popular question that you are getting a lot of is, could you recommend some websites for gamification? Um, if you'd asked me this four or five years ago, I would have been able to do it because I had all this stuff um, set up. Right now, I, I don't because I'm not doing a lot of teaching where gamification would be accepted. So anything I give you is going to be four or five years out of date. Luckily, there's this thing called Google where you can simply just Google gamification. I swear you would come up with much, much better stuff than I could share with you right now. Um, there are a couple of good books that are out there about gamification. Um, there's one by a woman called Jane McGonigal. It's not specifically about gamification, but um, she talks about the value of games in daily life. And there's a lot of really interesting stuff in there about um, how games can can make everybody's life better. She's also done a TED talk, or uh, she's got a sister as well. Um, and maybe her sister's done the TED talk. But if you if you search for ah oh, perfect uh, McGonagall TED talk, you'll find it, and and it's really interesting to to listen. Um, and there's some stuff she's done which is really quite interesting, and that for me gets me thinking about gamification in a way that might help my students. Thanks, Christian. Thank you for those answers. Um, I think we're actually out of time. 
So thank you all for your time and your attention and spending your Friday afternoon or Saturday early morning with us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you especially to Christian for your time. Thanks everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you everyone, bye.